Live from downtown Vancouver at the Vancouver Film School campus, it's time for EP Live. Hey, welcome to EPN. My name is uh, Victor Lucas, and uh, we bring you the latest in everything cool. You guys are very kind. Thank you very much. Mwah, mwah. I love that. That's very, very sweet. Happy Friday, everybody. It is almost the weekend. We're basically your last stop until the weekend when all kinds of fun madness can uh, befall all of us, right? Uh, including lots of playing of excellent video games, which we are going to be talking about today. Uh, we've got a very cool guest. Um, his name is Brian Bernal, and he is the CEO and co-founder of uh, um, a game called, uh, a system called the Poly Mega, and it allows you to play all kinds of retro video games, going back to, uh, of course, the NES is covered there, and the Super Nintendo, and the Genesis, but also all of the CD-ROM-based systems out there. Sega CD, the Sega Saturn, the Dreamcast, the original PlayStation. It's ridiculous. And we're going to dive deep into that and uh, find out all about the history of this machine, when it's coming, how much it will cost, all of that stuff. Uh, but first, we have a rundown to get to, and today it is dedicated to our friend Dakaris, who says, it's like I'm watching Judgment Day all those years ago. <laughs> I love it when people find the content and go, oh my god, I know this guy. <laughs> I, I get that comment a lot, which is fantastic. Thank you for watching, Dakaris. This run down is all yours. All right, the recent Superman movies might not have been very heroic at the box office, but that isn't stopping the character from multiplying on the small screen. Today at Comic-Con, DC revealed that Superman Returns star Brandon Routh will reprise the Kryptonian role in the next crossover event for the Arrowverse TV shows. Routh already appears on the Arrowverse shows as Legends of, uh, Legends of Tomorrow as another hero, the Atom, but the next crossover episodes will see him instead play Superman alongside another version of the character, Tyler Hawkland's incarnation from Supergirl. This will be Ralph's first time donning the iconic red cape since Superman Returns hit Earth in 2006. The new crossover episodes air this fall, and in case you didn't know, we shoot this show live. That's why you can hear sirens race by uh, every once in a while. We shoot this live at the, the uh, VFS Cafe at 390 West Hastings. I am super stoked that Brandon Routh gets to be Superman again. I thought he was terrific in Superman Returns. The movie was a bit dour. It was a bit of a bummer. Uh, but one thing they got right with that film was casting him. He was a terrific uh, Clark Kent, and he was a terrific Superman. And yes, he evoked Christopher Reeve, uh, but that was the right choice. Christopher Reeve is iconic. He is one of the best interpretations of the character we've ever seen, and Superman Returns definitely played homage to it, and Ralph still feels like Christopher Reeve. When you watch him as uh, Arrow, uh, or when you watch him as the Atom on uh, Legends of Tomorrow, you get that vibe off of the guy. He just seems genuine. He seems like a uh, uh, like a pretty positive kind of force out there, and I've liked his work. So uh, uh, I know that there's a lot of Henry Cavill fans out there that are going to be disappointed that it looks more and more likely that he is not going to be Superman again. But this would be an incredible turn if DC suddenly says, you know what, we like Brandon Routh again. Let's make him Superman one more time. And maybe frame it from a different vantage point because now, of course, he's, what, 10, 15 years older since uh, Superman Returns came out. He could add some nice shading to the character. Uh, but uh, thumbs up on that one. Super psyched to watch it. And, of course, it's going to be Arrow's last season. So uh, I'm interested to see how that all plays out and how all, the, all these different uh, actors play together. Also, the Batwoman TV show is going to launch very soon. Now, Marvel hasn't really made any big movie annou announcements yet at Comic-Con, but they're shaking things up on the small screen. Marvel and ABC have announced that this is upcoming seventh season of their TV show, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., will be its last. The announcement was confirmed at Comic-Con with the show cast and crew thanking fans for their support over all these years. The team promises that the final season will bring the show and its characters to a satisfying conclusion and they've already begun filming the final episodes. No word yet on when the uh, they're going to air, but in the meantime, the current sixth season will end this August and um, th this honestly is a show that I've uh, I've got some distance from. There's been so many different shows that have uh, come up and hit my radar that I've uh, I've shifted over to a lot of stuff. This is one of the casualties. I haven't watched Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. in a long time, and I know that it got a lot better. It started to get 
weird and went off on some strange tangents that I wasn't a huge fan of, uh, but I know that they reined it in. I, I've been talking to fans over the years that uh, really speak highly of what the, they did creatively with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And of course, we just saw Phil Coulson uh, in the Captain Marvel movie. Uh, he was de-aged a bit, but it was great, great actor, great character, and um, you know, I hope that he is honored and all the rest of the, uh, the cast members are honored as they conclude the show. It's always sad when we see, you know, we fought so long, all of us fans of superhero culture, for weekly shows that really honored the medium of comic books in a great way, and we finally got them. And uh, now we have so many of them, it's hard to keep track. But it's always sad like to see Arrow ending and to see uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. ending and other shows only getting one season and they're gone. But uh, we have a lot to choose from. It's a good problem to have. All right. Uh, with Game of Thrones finished, another epic fantasy franchise is coming to the small screen. A live-action TV series based on the Warhammer 40,000 or 40K franchise is in development. Warhammer owner Games Workshop has partnered with Man in the High Castle creator Frank Spotsnitz to make the show a reality, with the goal of turning it into a big-budget series in the same vein as Game of Thrones and upcoming shows like Amazon's Lord of the Rings and Netflix's The Witcher. Like, like the Warhammer 40K tabletop games, video games, and books, the show will take place in a dark, futuristic universe where humanity fights for survival against rival factions. No word yet on what networks or streaming platforms might be interested. Uh, this could be amazing. But as we've seen with a lot of the video game adaptations of Warhammer 40K, they can also be all over the map. And I think one of the challenges with Warhammer 40K is that uh, there's just so many ways in to this world. A lot of people don't play the tabletop, so their first exposure is some crappy uh, mobile game that, that uh, they put on their, their phone for five minutes and they go, well, I don't, want, I don't like this, and, it, and it's gone. So I think if this is happening, there's got to be a lot of uh, you know, cleaning up the story and giving us a good sense of what the myth uh, around Warhammer 40k is all about. I've loved some of the uh, the Warhammer games that uh, Relic has worked on. Uh, those RTS experiences are phenomenal. So if you're curious, that's what I would dive into, even though the third one was a little bit uh, uh, leaning in the League of Legends direction and it pissed off a lot of the fans of the first one. There was still some excellent work in there and a lot of uh, yeah, appeasement as well. Uh, as these games continued on, there were, the developers were working hard to bring back the fans and bring back people into the fold. Now, that's not to say that the tabletop Warhammer 40K doesn't have its own devout following and uh, a, you know a lot of love out there in uh, in this space. There are, are actual games workshop uh, outlets like Apple stores when you travel around. I remember one of the ones that I saw was in Edinburgh a couple of years ago and they had this full on, you know, come into our games workshop HQ here and, and dig into our tabletop stuff, which is incredible. So clearly there are fans out there and clearly this universe can be mined for some interesting stuff. Um, I just hope that it's a, 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 you know, a concise message and we all get it and the visuals look great and the casting is cool. Uh, but I'm all for more fantasy on television. That sounds awesome. Uh, and I think that's what everybody's trying to do is fill the void that Game of Thrones is leaving for us, including HBO with all of its uh, prequel series that they've got in the works. Uh, now, Linda Hamilton and Arnold aren't the only Terminator icons returning for the latest film. During their Comic-Con panel, the makers of Terminator Dark Fate confirmed two new details about the movie. It will see original John Connor actor Edward Furlong return to the role for the first time since Terminator 2, and the movie will the new movie will also be R-rated. This will make it the first Terminator movie with a hard R since T2, so expect plenty of good old-fashioned violence and swearing. Hollywood is shot away from R-rated movies because they mean fewer people can see them at the theater, but that attitude has changed since the blockbuster success of Deadpool. That film's director, by the way, Tim Miller, is also directing Dark Fate. It lands this October. Now I'm very excited. I, I actually was wondering, what the hell is up with Edward Furlong? I have not seen or heard of uh, that guy for a long time. And he was kind of annoying in T2. And, you know, not everybody might not agree with this. But I, when, I remember when I saw it in the theater, I was like, this kid is kind of annoying. Uh, but as you watch that movie again and again, and it's a nearly perfect film, let's be honest. T2 is so incredible. As you watch it again and again, you see that that, that whiny, brat, punky kid it, it was kind of perfect as well. You know, but it takes time to kind of uh, get used to it, I think. Uh, kind of in the way that Mark Hamill's whininess in uh, Empire Strikes Back, it took a little while for, for us to get used to that, too. Um, I hope I'm not creating any 
friction on the internet, God forbid. <laughs> but, uh, but Edward Furlong, uh, yeah, he was, um, I guess, an acquired taste, but I've missed him in these Terminator movies, you know, and uh, it's crazy. He, he was a kid, John Connor, and now he's going to be a, a middle-aged John Connor in uh, a new Terminator flick. I cannot believe that this is happening. And please, Tim Miller, don't drop the ball. You know, with all of that talent behind this thing, it's got to be awesome. I really hope it's awesome. All right, you guys, that is going to be our uh, rundown for today. Thank you for watching that. Now let's move on to this day and everything cool. Welcome to This Day and Everything Cool for July 19th. On this day in 1991, the Final Fantasy series ventured onto a whole new platform and started fighting in a whole new way. Final Fantasy IV was released on the Super Famicom in Japan, making it the first entry in the series released on the new console. Thanks to the extra power of the system, the game was much bigger, with more characters and environments to explore, and much better graphics and audio. As for the gameplay, it was also the first Final Fantasy game to use the active time battle system. Unlike the previous games, which used more slow-paced turn-based mechanics, the active time battle system allows players to input commands in real time, which makes the battles much more fast-paced and intense. Final Fantasy IV received critical acclaim and is widely considered one of the best games in the entire franchise, but here's where things get a little confusing. The game would find its way to North America on the Super Nintendo later that same year, although when it did, the title was changed from Final Fantasy IV to Final Fantasy II. This is because the original two II and three hadn't been released in the West at that time, so Square changed the title to a avoid confusing everyone. An enhanced remake of Final Fantasy IV was released on the Nintendo DS in 2007. All right, you guys, we have an incredible guest today on EP Live. Give it up for Brian Burnell. He is the CEO and co-founder of Playmaji, uh, which all sounds cool, but what's really cool is the product that they're developing. It's called Polymega, and it is a console that will allow you to play how many classic consoles, Brian? What's your what's your dream here with Polymega? It's a lot. I mean, it's a it's a modular system, so it's really as many as you can imagine, and maybe someday even things that we don't even know about yet. So it's uh, it's made to be the ultimate future-proof system. Uh, there's uh, you know there's a lot of game consoles, a lot of retro game consoles that are out there, and it's kind of difficult to um, choose which one is is the right one for you. Um, you know, I'm a, maybe some of the folks that are watching this are pretty hardcore gamers. Yep. Um, and maybe some other people are not so hardcore and maybe a little bit more casual. So uh, we've tried to create a uh, system that's uh, open and available to everyone to be able to play and experience the classic games, no matter if you like the really popular ones or even the ones that are really obscure. And, um, and we hope to be able to keep games living on into the future, far into the future. Awesome. Um, so that they, uh, they can be experienced by more people. Uh, I, I want to get a little bit into your history, but first, let's break down exactly what you're launching with, with Polymega. So it, there's like a base system, and what games will that base system play? Well, um, I've got the system in my lap here, so you can, you can see it. Cool. So this is the, the Polymega, and you can see it is a, uh, the system here has an optical disk drive. So yep. one of the key features of it is that it's capable of playing uh, CD-based systems for classic game consoles such as the original PlayStation, uh, the Sega Saturn, the TurboGrafx CD, the Sega CD, and also the Neo Geo CD. So when you get the base unit, uh, and this is uh, on pre-order for $299 US dollars right now, yep. when you get this, you're able to play all those systems right out of the box. So if you have some old CDs laying around, maybe in a, in a wallet or something like that, you can plug them in, you can play them on the system, but not, not only that, you can also install those games to the system so that you don't have to keep using those old CDs anymore. Oh, that's great. And it gives great. you a really nice interface and everything that you can use to, uh, to play all your classic games. Is that now, gonna be internal storage or, is, or are you gonna have to plug in a USB hard drive? Um, it has internal storage, so it has 32 gigabytes of, uh, of uh, a 32 gigabyte nano SSD on the okay. main board. Okay. Uh, that is expandable. There's an SD card slot in the back, as cool. well as an M.2 2280 SSD slot on the bottom. Wow. And so that's going to allow you to install up to about two terabytes of games. 
uh, right now. So it's cool. <laughs> you're getting applause for that. That's very that's very cool. So uh, let's let's break down those those systems that that uh, come with the base unit again. Just let's uh, so we've got Turbo Graphics CD, PlayStation yep. One, Sega CD, uh, Saturn, and there was one other one. The other one was Neo Geo CD. Neo Geo CD, now, fantastic. Neo Geo CD is an, is an interesting one because that system wasn't really known for having the best loading times. Uh, yes. So it wasn't well adopted for that reason. But it's still a great system when you can actually get into the levels and play the games. That's so, awesome. So uh, one of the things that we fixed on this system was the load times. Um, so they are going from about uh, a minute or so, sometimes for load times, down to just a couple of seconds. Uh, so it makes it a lot easier to play those games. And, and if you've always been kind of thought about getting into Neo Geo collecting, this is a great way to get into it because the games are a lot less expensive than uh, the AES versions, which was the home versions with the large cartridges. Right. And they're a lot more accessible. So um, And it's a great system. So we definitely recommend checking it out. That's very cool. Now, the games, uh, well, I have to ask about Dreamcast. So Dreamcast is not on the system now, or is that something that you guys are working on? Well, never say never. Um, we are currently not launching with Dreamcast, but Polymega is a fully uh, online and updatable console. So we'll be rolling out uh, new system support, new features, uh, new ways of interacting with your games uh, long into the future, we hope. And um, having a unified platform that allows you to do all this stuff um, is really um, going to be a boon to that. So you'll see more and more content and hopefully more systems coming out on the CD side uh, for the future. Awesome. Now, when you're playing the games from the CD, uh, are, are we playing them um, as emulated emulated games, or is it a, um, or a, a different sort of way to access this content? Yeah, so um, the CD system, so, so basically Polymega is an emulation-based system. Okay. Uh, we've licensed a lot of the best emulators that are out there, and we have the developers that are on our team who are working on this and making sure that the experience is high quality across all of the systems that we support. And um, one of the reasons why we chose to go an emulation route rather than something like an FPGA is because we wanted to support some of the more demanding 32-bit systems and possibly even higher in the future. And um, so one of the things like, for example, uh, one of the key features of the system is the Sega Saturn. Um, there's uh, quite a few, I mean, if you have an Android device, you can download an Android emulator. Um, but one of the things that's really tricky about it is that there's not really high compatibility on a lot of those emulators. You might see little bugs and glitches and things like that. And right. it ends up being kind of a frustrating experience after you've, you've tried to play a few games, um, especially if you like something that's not well supported by that emulator. Um, Polymega's emulators uh, are really, really highly compatible. So that allows you to you know, get in and play those games and have the experience that's, uh, that's really reminiscent of how it, how it felt playing on the original console. Uh, our Sega Saturn emulation is about 99% compatible. Right. Uh, we had to write a new, a new BIOS for it for it to be able to, uh, to, be able to launch this product. Um, and uh, we were very, very happy to see that we had very high compatibility with games for that system. Awesome. So even the weird, weird stuff or more ones that you might have played on other systems that, that could be a little tricky or hard to play, um, they run great on Polymega. And um, it's meant to be just as simple as plugging in a CD and starting it up. And there's no, no configuration, no weird stuff you have to download and all that kind of stuff. It's literally you put it in your living room, plug in a CD and, and go. That's very cool. Now, the story with Polymega, of course, isn't just these CD-ROM games that you guys are launching with. Uh, you're also launching with the modules. And how many different console modules are you guys launching with? So at launch, we're releasing four modules. So yep. we have a module for the original 8-bit NES. We have a module for the 16-bit Super NES. We have a module for the Genesis. Uh, and that also supports... Uh, uh, the 32X console, which is an add-on for the original Sega Genesis, and yes. uh, that one's a little tricky to to emulate as well. So we have full support for that, and all you have so to you do just is just plug in the original cartridge. Really? So you don't need to put the 32X into the you just put in the 32X into the cartridge slot, and it works. Yeah, yeah. You plug in the the module that that you buy with our system. Yep. Plug in a 32X cartridge into the same cartridge port that accepts the Genesis and and uh, Mega Drive. It's region free, of course, uh, across all the modules. Um, with the exception of Famicom. Famicom is not supported on the original Nintendo module. Gotcha. Uh, but all the rest of them are completely region free. And all you do is just plug in that game. Um, it shows up. There's a beautiful user interface that displays the game information, screenshots of it. Uh, and then you can play that game right there, or you can choose to install it to the system. And once you install it, you don't have to use that game cartridge anymore. It works kind of like the old iTunes 
Yep. If you remember back in the, you know, back when that first launched, you can just plug in your CDs, uh, music CDs, and it would rip those uh, those CDs to your collection on your computer, and then you would take it on the go, sync it to your iPod, and and, and listen in your car and all that. Polymega works exactly very similarly, actually. Um, the only difference, really, is that once you've installed that game to the UI, you get a beautiful Netflix-style interface uh, that has all the game information and all that kind of thing. Now, I've I've got I've got a Sega Saturn uh, fish tank simulator going on behind me here. Oh, this that's is, great. Uh, Aqua so, Zone for the, the Sega Saturn. <laughs> so we have an actual working Polymega machine right behind you in real time. That's terrific. Yeah, I'm going to put myself on this. No, I'll see if I can get myself on the screen so I can see real quick. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, if you, uh, no, let's see. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to have to turn around here for a second because I'm in a very small window in the Oh, in the yeah, sketch. no worries. So, but uh, I know my way around this enough to, to get around a little bit. So you can see, yeah, that you have a very nice interface here for managing your collection. You can go in and you know sort through the different games. Um, you can see information about them, and you can look at screenshots. Brian, I love this. I love this. The fourth module that you didn't mention too is the Turbo Graphics uh, Express, right? Or Turbo Graphics? What? Turbo Graphics 16. Yeah. 16. That is, yes. Um, I yep. gotta say that's one of my favorite systems. It's definitely a dark horse that's out there. Um, but it is, um, it's one of the best ones around, in my opinion, and it did not get enough love in the United States. So uh, we're big, purport, uh, big supporters of it. We're really happy. Even Konami is releasing a new uh, TurboGrafx-16 Mini. We're excited about that because we want more people to know about that system. Yeah, and I guess you work in concert with a lot of the, uh, this, this boom in retro gaming and all of its different cycles, whether it's Nintendo with its online service stuff and people able to play NES through the emulation on the Switch or people picking up these mini systems. Uh, or like even a company like Analog, you guys are different than Analog. Um, and there was a little bit of a Twitter spat going on there for a little bit. Are you guys okay with analog now? Is everything cool with uh, with analog? We have no problems with anyone. Honestly, like as long as people are supporting the hobby, it's it's great. And you know, I think that you know, in the in the context of that situation earlier this year, uh, you know, there was a lot of pressure all over the place, and we were getting ready to announce a lot of stuff, and we needed to get all that stuff out there before we uh, were talking. And you know, we've kind of. Uh, taken a step back and, and looked at how, how that went down and, and just really said, okay, let's just focus on the product and focus on getting our message out there. And um, you know, everyone else who's doing stuff in retro, it, I'm actually, I, I have no, uh, no qualms to say that, that I'm excited for just new stuff when it comes out because as long as games are being played by more people uh, and these games are, are living on into the future, um, we're, we're, that's what we're all about. And uh, we hope that Polly Megan for, the, for that yes. to happen. Is that the is that the the sort of mission statement for uh, Play Magi, uh, Play Magi or Polymega in general? You guys want uh, the perpetuation of this classic, you know, content to, to be available to people. You want it to to live on so that future generations will always have access to this stuff. That's right. Yeah, we think constantly about how games like this are played 20 years from now. How yeah. do people in in the future? access and play these games and maybe it won't be like this version of polymega that allows people to do that but maybe it's some combination of what we're doing and and some other new technology that comes out that allows us to do it there's great stuff going on in the open source scene i have no no qualms about uh what's going on there i think that you know products like polymega wouldn't be able to exist if it wasn't for the open source scene so sure. i think that there's an acknowledgement that needs to happen there yeah. um, but at the same time there's a there's a, a fundamental problem which is that most people have a hard time setting up those types of systems. Well, yeah, it, so it sounds like you guys too, you're trying to create like one machine that you plug in with through one HDMI port and you have access to all of these different libraries if you keep adding the, uh, the modules to everything. So you mentioned That's it's $300 for the launch uh, component of the Polymega and then how much are the modules going to be going for? Uh, the modules are 59, and um, basically all you do, so the, the way the modules work, and I, I've got the system here, so if you eject this, the, the this is the dust cover that comes with it right here, and this part right, right here just slides right off. Cool. So you've got that, and then you can plug in a different module. So I'm going to insert the, this is the Nint original Nintendo module. Awesome. You can see it here. So we'll just plug it in here and then snap it in. That's so go. slick. That's so Plugging slick. I love it. So let's talk. So these are going to be $60 each, roughly? 
Yep, sixty bucks. It's sold as a set, and it also includes a uh, a controller um, okay. for each one of them. Um, so this is our custom. We have custom designed controllers that have been made wow. for all of the different systems. That's great. And, that looks so uh, good. So every every one of the sets is going to have its own controller that's specific to that sort of era of gaming. That's right. Yeah. So each one of the module sets comes with a controller, and we didn't want people to have to go out there and dig through uh, thrift stores and all that kind of stuff to go to be able to start playing. Sure. Um, you know, one of the things that's always kind of hard and hard with retro game systems too is that a lot of them introduce lag, which can when you're when you're playing the old retro games. They felt a certain way when you were playing them back in the 80s and 90s. Yes. And um, if and a lot of times when you're trying to just plug in any old random USB controller, those uh, end up having a little bit uh, more overhead latency and lag, and right. it makes the experience feel bad. So I think that for a lot of people when they're playing on the old or on on some or trying to set something up like that, they end up having sort of this negative experience around retro games. And that's, uh, it's really core to our mission is that it needs to feel like the original game system uh, when you're playing it. And so one of the things we really focused on was having uh, these module controller ports. So when you plug into the actual module using the retro controllers, and you can even use an original NES controller or anything like that. When you do that, you basically are working at a very, very, very low amount of lag and latency. Cool. So it's under one frame of lag right now. That is and awesome. Let's it's talk a little bad. bit about your your company here for a second. You you guys are about sixteen people. You were telling me before we started. Is the background um, at the at, at the business all from gaming? And you guys all were just fans, and you had a mutual appreciation for the uh, for the history of the medium. It's a bit of a mix, um, yeah. to be honest. When the company was started, um, certainly the early uh, folks who came onto our team uh, were extremely enthusiastic about retro games, and that's why we created it. We yeah. ran into these problems and said, this, no one's really going to be able to enjoy these games uh, you know, with what's on the market right now, and so we made the Polymega. But um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that our whole team are even like huge gamers. I, like half. Uh, a bunch of the people that, that work on this project are just extremely pro people that uh, maybe don't, they remember playing games, but they just weren't, uh, they maybe are not much of gamers, but they don't need to be, like our mechanical engineering team and right. you know, folks who, who, who do different things on the project that are not related to the core experience. They clear, are part of the process. You guys all clearly see there's a space in the marketplace for this right now. I mean, you, you saw like Nintendo launches the NES Mini and the Super Nintendo Mini. You can't find them anywhere and people are jacking up the prices on eBay. There's this buzz that starts to happen. Um, and, and of course, the, the cartridge collection market is just huge out there too. When people are on eBay and Craigslist and there's all these retro gaming stores, it does feel like we've been pushing towards this. There's a there's a, a cloud of inevitability around this idea. You came though from traditional game making. You worked at Insomniac. You were a producer with Insomniac on on games like Ratchet and Clank. What was it about this that made you want to leave that trajectory and say no? I want to I want to kind of dip into the past and respect the the, the history of games. That's a, that's a great question, and, and I've never been asked that question, actually. So, um, and it is very important to me personally. So, um, working on big budget titles for current gen platforms, um, it was great. It exposed me to so much new information and technology and people um, that I'll hold as dear friends through my entire life. And even, uh, you know, the guys who I started this company with were also some of my coworkers at Insomniac from that time. Cool. Um, so one of the things that that um, that happened though was I ended up exiting the games industry for a while, and um, and part of that was because um, the demanding nature of yearly release cycles, um, the sort of like the ballooning of budgets and and multiple companies and just projects, uh, kind of getting so big that they almost they sort of sucked all the air out of the room. Um, I I basically was ready to, to kind of move out of the games industry. And I moved into other things. I moved into music. I moved into, I was a producer for for an advertising agency. Yep. And I got to work on a lot of different types of projects that helped me sort of recenter my vision of what why I started in games in the first place and what I love about them. And um, for me, that culminated in a trip to Japan that I took uh, just a few years ago. And um, I'm sorry if the light was got <laughs> just went off here. <laughs> uh, so, um, so what that what happened was I went to Japan and I I went retro game hunting because that's what I had always wanted to do, 
and um, and I found all the systems and games and everything that I used to read about in magazines, and I would bring the I brought them all back in two big suitcases and plug them all into my my HD TV, awesome. and realized that this was uh, that the picture quality was really bad. Well, right. Like, okay. Well, there's got to be ways to fix this. So I started looking into how to fix those old systems, and um, I was literally having to resolder capacitors, um, do RGB modifications on my console, doing things that I just didn't think that other people really would have the patience or understanding of how to, how to There's do. There's a thousand YouTube videos about all this stuff out there right now, too. Is there are, right? and it's great. It's actually really fun to learn all these things. Yes. And for a lot of people, it is, it's a great experience, and, and it can teach you something about, about electronics. But for most people that I know, people who are artistic, creative, don't have really, maybe you have kids and stuff like that, and that takes all of your time. Yep. Being able to uh, have a product that that sort of rinses away all of that uh, that that frustration and that aspect of the hobby, but just leaves you solely with the really good gameplay experience that you remember, uh, while also modernizing things. That is really what we want to get to, and That's I think awesome. that Playmaker achieves that vision uh, for a lot of people. You know, a lot of people are out there that say, "Oh, I can, I can do this on a Raspberry Pi. I can do it on a, on a uh, emulation PC, like a home theater PC." Yes, yes you can, but uh, but the time and effort that's spent uh, setting that up is not something that's uh, that's acceptable for a lot of people. And so, if you're the type of person who um, who has the time on your hands to do to do that, then then Polymega may not be the product for you. Yes. But if you're the person who is into mainstream games, maybe you have a PS4, maybe you play some Fortnite, you want to get some some retro games, maybe you played something when you you know back in the day, want to play some Bomberman with your friends, uh, you know, get around the couch. Like that's the kind of stuff that you're like, I want to play that one version that we used to play, or play some some GoldenEye, or play whatever. That's the that's where we want to be. We want people to have that nostalgic experience, but also uh, make it accessible and modern for people. Well, you're talking to the right crowd here. I know that everybody that watches EP, we talk about this a lot on the show, that there is this uh, move away from the classic gaming uh, too quickly, you know? And there's so many fantastic licensed games that uh, because a company loses the rights to them, they can't publish them again, they can't, we can't access it. And the only way to really do it is, is through either hunting down the cartridge on Craigslist or eBay uh, or emulating something. And the idea that there are these vast collections out there and people having to you know find different ways to play it, it it I get what you're doing and I know a lot of people out there really do as well I do I do want to say to the chat if you guys have any questions for Brian uh, help us out with uh, with all caps and go ahead and ask away and I'll get a couple of those in for it uh, before we let Brian go I do want to ask too um, about the um, uh, the, the, the sort of design of the Polymega system. It seems like you guys have some pretty decent industrial designers. There's a sleekness to it. Was that all an in-house um, concept? And, and like, like, did you guys figure out the, the shape and the look and the aesthetics of the console all internally, or did you hire that out? Um, so one of the first people who uh, joined our pro actually maybe even the first person apart from our, our CTO that came onto the project was our industrial designer. Um, he is a guy named Dane Tanner. He's very talented. Um, he worked for an agency uh, around the time that I worked in, in. I was working in advertising when I came to Polymega, yep. or when I started Polymega, and um, and we hit it off and we talked about our concept for what this was and we went through a full deep dive and exploration of all the different textures and materials and looks and and uh, the things that we wanted to have and and what. Uh, aspects of retro game consoles we wanted to incorporate into the Polymega while also considering how to take that all forward and make it a minimalist, modern approach uh, that uh, looks great in any living room. Um, Fantastic. So it was done, it was done mainly in-house. We went through a lot of iterations. Um, Dane was, is a part of our team, um, but, uh, but he is a contractor, so, so he does work on other projects too. Well, it does look sleek, and we're going to talk a little bit about the Kickstarter and everything here in a second, but I've got a question from Nintendo Boy 17 Would Polymega be region-locked or region-free? Was this ever asked? Uh, Polymega is region-free. Um, like I said, the only exception is that uh, the NES module is not compatible currently with uh, Famicom games. Right. And we are working on making uh, an adapter that will allow you to, to uh, play the Famicom games in the future, but it'll be post-launch as a software update. That's cool. Okay, so you guys um, came to Kickstarter with this idea as a concept first. How did the Kickstarter run for you? Well, this project was actually never on Kickstarter, officially, oh, okay. or 
go. Um, we've always done it um, exclusively on our website. Oh. And the reason for that is because the Kickstarter format of um, having different uh, reward tiers that you can back um, doesn't really work with our system because it's sort of an a la carte system. Sure, sure. Uh, with, you would have, you could potentially have a hundred different combinations of items that you might want to get. So the format doesn't actually work with with what Polymega is. Um, okay. So we decided to put it on the Polymega website rather than that, or rather than, than Kickstarter. I'm sorry um, I got that wrong. I, I'm sorry, I got that confused. I guess there was another retro thing that I was looking at. So well, you guys- retro, yeah, I mean, there's plenty of retro Kickstarters for sure. <laughs> yeah, so, but you guys are coming to market this fall, right? When is everything gonna be available? Yeah, we are uh, we are injecting steel in in China right now, and we've got a bunch of motherboards that are being made in Taiwan, and we've got everything stacked up. And all we're waiting for right now is the chips from Intel. Um, so basically, and we have a, we are we are taking this time to continue to improve the software. So the yep. experience is getting better as um, as we go. Uh, we have a huge database of games. Uh, we have lots of little improvements and things like that that we're uh, constantly adding to the system, and we'll continue to do that even post launch. So have there already been a tremendous amount of pre-orders? Do you guys have a customer base already out there or is this still something that you're um, like you're still kind of growing and building? That's a great question. So um, yeah, Polymega has uh, done really well. Uh, the fans have spoken, so to speak. Cool. Um, the pre-order has done over a million dollars in, in pre-orders right now. Nice. Um, so people are, uh, are excited about it. And um, you know, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff going on. We have a new light gun that we just announced too, uh, which I think is something that people are very interested in. And um, you know, we're constantly going to be developing new products and solving a lot of the little issues that that are kind of hard uh, to solve for retro games uh, in the future. That's awesome. And if you want to pre-order everything, you have a price for that as well. Everything that you're ready with at launch, which would be the five different CD-based machines. On the yeah. is it is it, yeah, is it so the, ten consoles in total? Roughly? Yeah, so the, the easiest way to think about it is that you've got you've got all the CD games that work just with the base unit. You don't yep. need any modules or anything like that. They just work. Just plug in a, a game, a CD game, and it'll just play. Yeah. Um, if it's a cartridge-based game, you need to have a cartridge adapter, and there's yep. four cartridge adapters, aka modules, uh, that you can get, and that's uh, you can get everything all together uh, as a deluxe bundle for four ninety nine. On the website, 499. and that'll come with yep. all of the different individual controllers as well as the pack-in one that comes with the CD system as well. That's and right. Yeah, the CD, the ba the base unit has a universal controller that works with everything. Oh, it does. Okay. Yep. And then you, but with every module, you'll also get an additional controller as well. So you'll you'll be swimming in controllers. How, so how many? Yeah. How, how many different consoles in total are you guys launching? Is it nine or is it ten? Uh, it's more than that. Well, it depends on how you look at consoles. A lot okay. of people look at it based on the region that came out and all that, but um, you're looking at about 10 consoles that's, about that are 10. supported. It's incredible. That That is incredible. I've got a question from Jamie in the crowd here. What were some of the hurdles in making the machine? Um, there's been a lot of challenges. Um, you know, we're doing something that's never been done before. To release, and there, there's a reason you haven't seen a commercial CD emulation-based system, and that's because um, you have to be, uh, you have to have a team that's capable of creating BIOS software, which is basically the original firmware of the old consoles, um, and uh, be able to go through the full process legally to uh, reverse engineer that that original firmware and then also re-implement it. And that's something that's called a clean room. And um, that immediately will scare off a lot of developers because it's, yeah. it's, it's a <laughs> process. And uh, we had to do that in order to fulfill the vision of what we wanted to create. Um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people will say, oh, well, you know, what's so great about your console? Can't, can't Sony or, or Nintendo just release all these games themselves? The truth is, no, they can't. They, there's a lot of licensing issues with a lot of the old games um, you might have someone who died, and you know who knows where those rights are now. Um, you got might real have... dark, Brian. <laughs> What's that? You got real dark there, buddy. <laughs> I did, yeah. Well, I mean, the truth is that that um, you know we have about fifteen thousand games in our database, so um, there's no one like 
person or company or entity that's untangling all those licenses. Well, it's, um, it's always then, been crazy to me that like if especially because we're dealing with you're talking about physical media and the fact that so many like to release a console without backwards compatibility, it just seems like such a massive oversight and a real, you know, you're kind of sticking it to your customers. You're telling them that they can't port the stuff that they own and already use to their new console. And no other movie based medium would ever do something like that unless you're moving over to fully a different kind of technology from VHS tapes to, uh, to disc-based media. Uh, but, it, you know, there's, it drives me crazy. So I applaud the work that, that is going on here with this. I think this is fantastic. Uh, got a question about um, uh, any uh, uh, options in terms of the emulation. Are we going to be able to do, um, you know, scan lines and fast forward and, and play with the games in some interesting ways? That was from uh, uh, Blade Blur and Sam I Am 111. Yeah, um, so so one of the reasons, one of the other reasons that we went with emulation um, for our approach to playing the games is that we can offer all kinds of great features that would be very difficult to pull off on original hardware or, uh, you know, an FPGA type, type solution. So, um, for example, uh, one of the, the, so we have all your standard suite of things that you might, you would expect to have, such as save states, load states, um, you can take screenshots, uh, you can awesome. assign software turbo fire, uh, you can add, uh, we have really, really nice uh, composite and RGB video filters um, that model the exact look of the old TVs. And there's been a lot of people who have seen that in person and been like, wow, that's one of the best I've seen. And it's true, it looks really, really good. Um, so awesome. I think a lot will like that. That's uh, awesome. But, but even further than that, we can also, uh, there's great enhancements that we can offer for the games in the future. Um, you know, for our for our digital storefront, uh, we'd like to be able to do HD um, up-res NES games um, that have improved sound and four times resolution graphics running at the same speed off the original code. Uh, those are things that we're working with uh, with publishers to develop right now, so that when you buy a digital game through our through our marketplace, uh, which is something that we haven't even covered yet. Um, <laughs> when you buy a game from the digital marketplace, you can have an enhanced experience. You're um, launching 10 consoles at once, you're playing 15,000, and you're also going to be selling. you got a lot of stuff to talk about here, Brian. That's incredible, man. Uh, I've got one more question here from I uh, Ian McConaughey, and this is going to be the last from the chat. Uh, do the modules contain console-specific hardware, or is all the work done in the main unit purely, purely through emulation? Does it run better with a module cartridge versus loaded to the, um, to the uh, hard drive? Well, that's a good question. So um, the way that the modules work is uh, there's several interfaces that are that are uh, embedded in the module. So, uh, so one of them is assigned for taking the, the ROM off of the cartridge and installing it into the system. Uh, another one is meant for, um, for gosh, there's a lot to talk about. Um, yeah. You have the controllers that, that um, accept uh, bare metal signals. So you're basically getting that zero lag connection. Um, and we do have, uh, we have several interfaces that we've uh, planned uh, and built into the console that we may take advantage of in the future that will allow us to tap original hardware if we want to. Wow. Uh, so I, there's a lot. Of, uh, there's a lot of things that we can do with a modular system. One of the and someone asked recent or earlier yeah. what was the hardest thing about the project. Yeah. The hardest thing about the project is that is simply the fact that it was a modular system and we had sure. to think about the things that we're not thinking about and figuring out how like things that might happen or may or may not happen eight or nine years down the line. Um, so. Predicting all of those those needs from a technology perspective um, was probably the most challenging aspect like, of the project. Like an advancement in HDMI technology or something like that, or no, not really that, but more like um, if we want to support X system later down the line, what needs to be available on the base hardware right. so that it can so that it can be if we you know if we decided to make uh, a module that had um, you know an original uh, chip from the console on it. How would we do that? And one of the other things I didn't mention about the, the modules is that it has, uh, each one of the modules comes with the, the module itself and the controller, yep. but it also has uh, five games built into the module. It's, it's an amazing story, right? Like there's, there's a lot of stuff in there, Brian. I, 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 I honestly don't envy you because you have a big story to tell, you know? Like nobody's ever done anything like this and it's about freaking time that somebody's trying to do this. 
Um, I do ha I have a, I guess this pertains a little bit to your digital store. You had space at E3 where I actually physically met you for a moment and I checked out some of the software running and it was great. Um, and I became, you know, once you see it in reality, it's a whole other thing, right? You can see it on web pages and everything, but when you see it and people are holding controllers and playing a game, I'm sure for you it must feel that way too. It's like, oh my God, this is happening. Uh, but as a consumer, or as somebody that covers this stuff, it's like, yeah, this is, this is really happening. But you were at E3, surrounded by all of these publishers, that many of them own the IP of the games that you're standing in, or sitting in front of. How are they dealing with you guys? And are, are you getting any pushback from the Sonys and Nintendos and, and the other companies? Or are they welcoming you as a new player in this market? Well, that's a great question. So, um, so there's a, it's so with this situation, it depends on who we're talking to. We have a lot of publishers that we're already working with that are super excited about the Polymega and feel like this is a product that's been needed in market for a very long time. There's also publishers who um, who are uh, who are creating their own other endeavors right now around retro games, sure. and th those are the ones where we're uh, we're laying off a little bit and um, not trying to compete with them. We know that the once the mini consoles have had their um, time in the in the spotlight, uh, and everyone's purchased them or everyone's uh, who, who wants to get them has gotten them. Um, for us, we always think about what's next after that. You're right. You have a mini console, you have people who are collectors who are really hardcore uh, uh, hardware aficionados. So, what's the next big exciting thing that's going to happen after that? And uh, we're teeing up Polymega to have a platform where publishers of any size and type can publish their games onto the, our store and people can access them digitally. For those people who don't want to go track down, just like the controller, don't want to go track down game cartridges at a, at a thrift store, don't want to go track down controllers and accessories, but just want to play the games. Or right. maybe want to discover some new games. Uh, those are, that's really who the, who the console is made for. And speaking to those publishers, I think it's an inevitability. They're going to be competing against a lot of really big services that are out there uh, yeah. very soon. I mean, you yeah. see Google Stadia. Um, you see players moving into this space where it's going to be like territorial warfare. And um, you know, one of the things that's going to be a casualty of that is the is the concept of a game console. Yeah. And um, the game console needs to exist in the future because that's what makes. Uh, the original feeling of playing the games uh, uh, special, I think. So, I 100% agree. Uh, in that game store, are you going to have to have like the Genesis uh, module in order to play something that you buy digitally and download to the system, or can you just run it right off of the main system? No, you'll just play it. You'll just download it and play it. Um, mm. If you want the, the hardware, uh, you want to use the original Genesis controllers or use our pack-in controller for the module, um, you will need to get the module set. But um, our universal controller is perfectly capable of playing uh, any of those games. It has about two frames of lag, two and a half frames of lag, yeah. um, somewhere around there. Um, so it's a little bit slower. Um, it's not as quite, a, quite of a hardcore experience, but for a lot of people, that's okay. Right on. Jamie, last question. Do you have a price on the uh, the games themselves yet, Brian? Um, so we have tar we're targeting basically around like the four to seven dollar range, and it depends on the number of discs. Oh, how much yeah, yeah, you, you're making people happy, my friend. This is very cool. Now, one of the things with the uh, the Polymega is that it really ushers in or it sort of makes us remember the tactility of going to a store and purchasing hardware like this. GameStop announced that they're potentially going into the retro gaming market, which I think is a great move for that company, quite frankly. It's like the only move they got left at this point. Uh, uh, are, you part, are you queuing up a whole bunch of uh, retail partners that will uh, have a Polymega display and show how all the different modules will work and all that? Well, that's a great question. So um, one of the things and one of the reasons we've been so busy right after E3 is for exactly that reason. Uh, we've been flying around all over the place, talking to big, huge, massive distributors that um, that want to get Polymega uh, in their stores. And um, and I think that's one of the things that, that really needs to happen for uh, Polymega and for people to be able to access those games again. Um, Polymega, we've noticed that, just like you were saying a few minutes ago, it was one thing to see it on a website, one thing to read about it in an article, totally different thing to stand in front of it and play it. Totally. And um, I think pretty much everyone, even the most hardcore of the hardcore journalists, the biggest skeptics, 
everyone who plays it walks away with a big smile on their face and their phone up pre-ordering it pretty much that's so awesome. uh it's, it's it's really it's it's an experience that's unlike anything else that's out there um yes it's emulation based but it is a totally different beast even then and um i think that's one of the things that uh, that a lot of people it's fun to bark and, and, and talk. It's fun to write things on the internet, but when, when you actually see your friends playing it, you're probably going to want to go get, go get one, and that's just going to be how it is. That's great, man. Uh, everybody give it up for Brian Bernal for uh, taking some time today. Thank you, and um, I can't wait to review the Polymega. I'm a big retro gaming fanatic, so this is going to be a lot of fun, but good luck to you and all of your colleagues, and uh, we'll be looking uh, to get our hands on Polymega this fall, man. That's great. Thank, Thank you, so you Brian. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate right. it. Thanks, guys. All right, take care. And uh, speaking bye bye. of classic games, let's go back in time for this buried treasure. You know, even though he hasn't made tons of games, the shadow, pun intended, of Fumita Ueda stretches long and large across the video game industry. Case in point, the 2011 game Lost in Shadow, which Sam I Am 111 suggested that we take a look at today. And I think it's a fantastic choice. This came out for the Wii. It was also made available on the Wii U as an eShop title. And Lost in Shadow is a fantastic 2D action adventure platformer. The conceit here is that you are playing a character a character shadow in the background and you've got a light source that's in front of you that you may be able to reposition depending on the puzzles that befall you but you have to kind of pay attention to the foreground and the background and that creates a whole new set of skills that you need to have you need to wrap your mind around the 3d qualities of this 2d platform game and it was so imaginative and so fresh and it had you know certainly an eco type vibe and I think many of us in the game biz were still glowing from our joy of Eco and Shadow the Colossus. But it was really just a moody, minimalist, stripped down, but beautiful experience. And it was one of the standouts on the Wii. And it was one that I remember, I think I reviewed this with Scott Jones, and we were just continually bringing it up. And I'm sure I've even brought it up as a buried treasure in the past. But here we are in 2019, and it's time to talk about Lost in Shadow again, because it's absolutely a great buried treasure. All right, you guys, it's time for me to take a, uh, a look at uh, The Lion King with this reviews on the run from the studio. I went and checked out a uh, matinee of the movie today uh, just before we started rolling on, on EP Live here. And uh, I went in with very low expectations, and Blake had a big laugh about that because I'm sure Disney doesn't want people going into any of their movies with low expectations. And you wouldn't expect that something with the, uh, the cachet of The Lion King, this universally acclaimed and well-known property, uh, as it's transitioned to this this sort of live action kind of uh, recreation um, would give anybody low expectations. But the early buzz was that uh, some of the emotion just wasn't really there with these animals because they're photo real CG recreations of animals that we might see if we ventured out if we got outside and left our video game systems for five minutes, we might see animals like this somewhere. Um, and uh, so it was a bit weird and it was weird to see it in the trailers. And so I walked into the theater thinking, I, I don't know if I'm going to dig this, man. I think it's going to be very odd to see animals that don't have any emotion in their face singing love songs to each other. And there, you can see the criticisms and the complaints about that. And there's, it's, you're, there's definitely validity there because the animals don't emote like cartoons. They look like true-to-life animals. And uh, first of all, kudos to the visual effects teams involved in this, because not only are the animals fully computer-generated creations, but the entirety of the world that they're in. It's not like they superimposed CG animals into plate shots. Everything was created in a computer in this. So it's a new form of animation, and that got my mind thinking of a few things. Obviously, video games. It's like we're looking into the future of photo reel right here for uh, how our games are going to look in the next you know, 5, 10, 15 years, um, which is mind-blowing. And purely on those aesthetics alone, this movie is interesting and worth checking out. Um, now... Emotionally, it doesn't have the resonance of the classic animated feature, partially because it's not new. It's almost a you know a shot for shot remake in a lot of ways. And so, if you're at all familiar with the animated movie, which let's face it, most of the population of the planet Earth is, um, they're not going to be shocked by where the story goes. They're going to sit down. They're going to hear some songs. They're going to see uh, uh, what is it, Timon and Pimba? I, I always get. 
Timon and Pimba. Yes? Pumba. Pumba. Okay. Uh, you're going to see them singing and dancing. And we've got Seth Rogen as uh, Pumba, uh, and he's got his laugh, and he's very funny. Uh, and they're they're great. I actually was surprised by Billy Eichner's singing voice. He's actually very good as Timon. I couldn't believe it. Um, Chiwelli, 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 how do you say it? Chiwetel Ejiofor? They have a hard name to say. Chiwetel Ejiofor is fantastic as Scar. Um, maybe not as resonant as uh, Jeremy Irons, I think, played the original. Um, James Earl Jones is incredible as Mufasa, again, uh, taking over the, the mantle there, and he's great. And I actually like Donald Glover and Beyonce as our, our two sort of main romantic leads in there. Uh, they do a great job as well. Um, but yes, you are picking it apart. You're picking it apart technically. You're picking it apart uh, uh, I think financially, you're thinking, okay, well, what's Disney's uh, calculation here? You know, are, are they, um, they just basically had a bunch of accountants going, okay, we can make the X number of millions based on, or billions based on uh, bringing this back out to market with all of these incredibly famous people. Um, and, and it's easy to get down those paths. And, and I was doing that, but I was also surprised that the story is so powerful and so effective. It's an animated version of Hamlet, basically. Uh, and there's betrayals. It's not like I have to tell you the story of Lion King, but it, it's, it's got some darkness and some, some heaviness and some uh, uh, you know, miscommunication and some uh, coming of age type, type of elements in there and some people realize, some characters realizing their importance in the, in the grand story of it all. And I was kind of taken by it. I was certainly taken in by the relationship between Mufasa and Simba. Uh, and that father-son dynamic was really, really powerful. Even, you know, through the conveyance of uh, uh, these photoreal lions, it still got me. It was still effective. And the music was pretty damn cool. This isn't my favorite of all of the Disney uh, uh, musical movies out there, but they've done a solid job with the orchestrations of it. Uh, Hans Zimmer does the orchestral score, and that's all terrific as well. And it's all the classic songs that you know and love. Um, so I came away, the end effect was, I, st I think that this is a, um, it's a successful enterprise. It's going to placate and please a lot of people out there, busy people that aren't going to be um, so quick to kind of criticize it and, and uh, pick it apart and, and place it next to what they know about the Lion King. They're, they're just going to go to be entertained. It's going to work on that level. It's also easy to wear a critic's hat and, and say, well, why did we need this? You know, But one of the other weird things that came to me as I was watching this is that there could possibly never be a better time for... Um, anthropomorphized animals to be on screen that look like real life animals that are adorable as hell. For humans to see that and to recognize as we are losing species of animals all over the earth right now, how powerful and important and integral these animals are in our world. And that's what the Lion King also kind of projects as well, is that yes, they can embody human traits and characteristics and sing and be played by Beyonce, but still that, that uh, that animal kingdom is is beautiful and magical and uh, um, majestic and worth protecting and preserving, you know. And that's also the other feeling that I got when I was watching this movie. So I say uh, uh, bravo to uh, John Favreau and his creative team. I think they did a, a pretty damn incredible job putting this together. Um, yes, there's a sheen of it being a little bit unnecessary, but I think people are going to be super entertained when they go out and see The Lion King. I'm going to give it an eight. Out of 10. All right. Okay, now the other thing that we ran out of time for was uh, let's play and chat today. We were going to play a little bit of uh, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3, but the interview with Brian was so interesting and he had 10 consoles to talk about. <laughs> so there was a lot of stuff to get into. So we aren't going to play uh, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3, but I have played a bunch and I've got my uh, first thoughts and impressions for you right now. If we want to survive this, we do it as a team. Yesterday, I got my code for Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3, The Black Order, and I've been putting hours into this game. I'm not quite ready to do the whole full review because I'm, I'm not as deep into the game as I want to be, but I wanted to give you guys some first thoughts. And my review so far... 
It's a team-based action role-playing experience with storytelling that has been overseen by Marvel, and there's some great talent involved, some great voice talent involved, portraying characters that we know and love from the movies and from the comic books and the animated series. So you get something that's immediately enjoyable if you are a comics nerd or if you're a superhero fan it puts a smile on your face and that's what the other marvel ultimate alliance games did as well wouldn't be the first time sweetheart and it was interesting because this game collects pretty much every marvel character that you would want out of the gate but yesterday as the game was released or you know just starting to hit the eShop, there was a comic-con panel where the season pass plans were announced as well and we're going to be getting other new characters as part of the season pass for marvel knights as well as the Fantastic Four, yeah, and X-Men, which is really cool. And also we're getting Cyclops and Colossus as free DLC, I think in August. So there are extensive plans to keep adding to Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 over time. The chaos has just begun. I think that's wonderful. I mean, I, I, you guys know me, I'm a huge superhero fan, and I love the first two Marvel Ultimate Alliance games. I think I played one of them on the PSP from start to finish as well, and I freaking love that game. You have proven far more resourceful than I would have imagined. It's just a really inviting and accessible way to play with all of these superheroes as if they were action figures. It's like an action figure RPG. It's like you got your whole collection of figures and you can mix and match and throw make teams that you want to. At one point I had Spider-Man, which was uh, the Peter Parker Spider-Man, the Miles Morales Spider-Man, Gwen Stacy, Spider-Gwen, Spider-Woman, and Venom. Is that Venom on your team? He may seem lethal, but when the world really needs him, he always chooses to protect it. They were my team, my team of four, and I was running around doing all kinds of great combos and beating up bad guys in lots of vicious and super cool ways. <laughs> You have some concessions that you have to kind of deal with when you're grappling with all of these different characters and trying to, you know, maintain some sort of sense of order. You can, of course, play this game with local co-op or online co-op. And so right away you're contending with characters that may be extremely overpowered, like Captain Marvel or Iron Man, where you know they can just be flying and zipping around all over the place. But of course there are constraints so that, they, you know, the characters kind of stay together. But the camera in the game is going to try to deal with that. And also the other thing that I noticed, even in my short amount of playtime with it so far, I put about five hours into this, when everything is firing on all cylinders, when you've got all the superpowers and everybody's smacking and hitting and there's a crowded field of bad guy, it gets a little nuts. It gets a little crazy. It gets a little bit difficult to kind of, just, you know, decipher who you are, where you are, what character you're playing. Whatever's happening, we can beat it. Keep fighting. And of course, I was playing it just a little bit before it launched, and I tried to find people to play with online, and there was nobody to play with online. I did see one of my buddies in the game industry boop on with playing Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3, and I thought, oh, he's just going to be getting into the game right now. I'm not going to bug him and say, join my game. But that's what I intend to do today on EP Live, is play some online and hopefully play with some people that watch the show, which is going to be fun. Is this some kind of joke? I would say overall, visually, the environments that I've seen so far, not that impressive but because the game isn't super focused on giving you like a photo real insomniac spider-man kind of single player story thing it's really just like setting up a playground so you're gonna see some you know not incredibly exciting world building in terms of environment art and stuff like that but it kind of leaves it open for the developers to keep adding more and more sort of modules to the game so uh, I guess that means we're cool then yeah presumably with all of this DLC content coming and with the idea that we can stretch further and further into the Marvel lore and the Marvel characters, it's going to make it, you know, approachable and believable for these game makers at Team Ninja to keep delivering us some fun content. Eh, I'll take what I can get. You're going to be able to dole out all kinds of great punishment and you're going to get into that groove of leveling up characters and finding your best teams and just taking the action figures off the shelf and continuing to play. That's really what this game is about. You're just going to have hordes of repeating kinds of bad guys, lots of different levels of kind of feel familiar and similar and this was true of the first two marvel ultimate alliance games as well well it may not be fine art but it's fine by me i'm really digging this so far as you could probably tell and i will have some further thoughts on this game on monday hold your fire for now yeah, if you're a comics fan like me or a superhero fan like me, I think you're going to have a big smile on your face with Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3. As much as I'd love to stay and play, there's still so much more that must be done. Fortunately, time is on my side. <laughs>
I shall be waiting here for you. All right, you can bet your butt I'm going to be playing Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 this weekend. And I'll have some more thoughts for you on Monday. I've been so hyped, and it's finally here in my hot little hands. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for coming down. Thanks to our guest, uh, Brian from uh, Playmaji and the uh, Polymega system. On Monday, we've got Chris Van Dyke, who is a uh, VFX uh, veteran in Vancouver. Uh, has worked on all kinds of incredible stuff. Most recently, uh, Stranger Things 3. So he's going to be talking to us about the process projects that he's worked on and uh, his new company and uh, I guess a little bit of the VFX scene here in Vancouver which is massive so it's going to be a great show please come back for that it's going to be Monday 4 30 p.m. right here from the uh, VFS cafe at 390 West Hastings or on the channel on the stream thanks for watching everybody have a great weekend and play forever